I mean, I go all over the place uh, for the monastery and uh, with St. Anna. Uh, St. Anna is a miracle-working icon. She is the grandmother of Jesus Christ, so that's the larger figure that you see. Uh, the smaller one is Mary, the mother of God, and I also brought the relics of Joachim and Anna and a very tiny thread of the belt of the mother of God. Uh, that belt is, by and large, kept, uh, for the most part, most of it is kept at Vatopedi Monastery on Mount Athos. Uh, so these are the treasures that abide in a monastery. These are the things that, uh, since uh, it's difficult for you to come to us, I come to you. I bring these treasures and open you up to kind of the mystery of what the church is, which is oftentimes housed in those monasteries. Speaking of Vatopedi Monastery, I was there about mm, a couple years ago, maybe three or so, and, you know, that monastery is 1,000 years old. 1,000 years old. So, and they've been doing daily services there, the liturgy, every day for 1,000 years. And every time that you do a service in the church, what happens is you bring almost, it's like you can imagine as if you had a fire, that's the altar, like a hearth, as it were. Um, and every time you do a service, you, you put a, a stick onto the, the burning. Hopefully it's been burning because, you know, you keep it burning by doing the services by praying, you know. Uh, think of the altar as a hearth and you have uh, the fire there and you put a, a log onto the fire. And you also take out a cup of the earth and you enlarge the hearth just a little bit more around the area where the fire burns. Um, in the monastery, because there's uh, daily services, uh, this phenomenon of adding a log and taking out some of the, uh, the to make more space for the fire at St. Tikhon's has been going on for almost 130 years. So every day liturgy is offered and liturgy is perfect prayer. And we always hear about that. The saints have perfect prayer. What is that? I don't know. What is perfect prayer? Well, the church already has perfect prayer. Perfect prayer is the liturgy. The liturgy is the epicenter of prayer, the life of prayer, which is perfect prayer for the entire world, a prayer on behalf of all and for all, living, departed, and those that will be uh, in the future to come. Everything is contained in the liturgy. And so that liturgical movement uh, that we have every day at the monastery and that they have for a thousand years at um, Manathos keeps that fire burning. It is the fire itself. Purpose of the sacramental life when you, when you receive the Eucharist is to give you a little bit of that fire, to give you a little bit of that light, a little bit of that light of the kingdom which is to come through that sacramental encounter with Christ that very body and blood of Christ. Just as Christ shone on Mount Tabor in his body, and then his garments were transfigured by that light, contact with his body caused his material world that he was encased in to also become illumined. In the same way, that light of that body that shone on Mount Tabor is given to you. You participate in it, you take it into yourself, and you become light. Christ says, you are the light of the world. He didn't say that because by nature we're light. It's because of that union that we have with him through communion. So we become light. We become theophoros, a light bear, God bearers, bearers of that light. And so this mystery of the liturgy is the epicenter of the Christian phenomenon. And not only that, but the liturgy itself is life. Christ said, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Christ comes to give us life and he gives us life at every liturgy. So, at Vatopedi Monastery, standing there probably, you know, one of their million hour services. Um, services going on for, you know, catastrophically amount, a long amount of time for us as, you know, Westerners. Sometimes up to 16 hours. Can you imagine that they have a little coffee break in the middle of it? It's that long. And of course, they don't have, you know, drip coffee. I'm sorry, they just have Nescafe or Greek coffee. So you don't get uh, the drip coffee there. But in that place, and in, that, in the middle of the night at like 2 o'clock in the morning, 
You see the iconostas in front of you, it's literally a stone iconostas. It's like these pillars of stone and this kind of long kind of mosaic-like iconostas, which is, uh, it's hard to explain, very big, very heavy. Behind the altar is the very cross that Constantine carried in to his battle when he defeated whatever enemy it was, I forget, and when basically the entire world had the opportunity to adopt Christianity at the Edict of Milan in 314. That's the cross behind the altar. And then there's all these treasures like the belt of the Mother of God and all these other things that you can't even imagine. Um, this is all housed in those monasteries. And at two o'clock in the morning, I could honestly say with, you know, like everybody else says, I didn't know whether I was in heaven or on earth. Liturgy was going on. That boundary between this world and the next world was somehow mitigated. And I was truly standing on the threshold of the abyss of heaven, looking down in saying, oh my goodness, this is the gate of heaven. And I knew it not. And so this mystery that we have in the church is the same thing, it's here as well. But because of that reality of the monastery, keeping that fire going, our hearth at the monastery is, you know, <coughs> palpable, and uh, I can sense it very deeply. It's, it's very much, it is the presence of God. It's the presence of God, the dwelling place of God on earth, and that fire is burning bright. In Manathos, it's so strong that it's almost overwhelming to the point of it's a consuming fire and it starts to feel a little bit too hot. Uh, and that's the mystery of God's presence. You know, so oftentimes we encounter a more, in our popular culture, kind of a, 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 a sentimental concept of who Jesus is. Well, St. Paul tells us very clearly, he says, our God is a consuming fire. And when we're talking about spiritual reality, like encountering the presence of God, sometimes it's not very pleasant. And in fact, the cross is actually the revelation of how God lives and what that life is like for us. How do we encounter God's life in our own life except as a cross? Because he is a consuming fire and he is everywhere present and filling all things. And he is the one who saves to the uttermost those who believe in him. We encounter that life of God as a cross. And oftentimes it is difficult. It's not pleasant. It could be painful even. So oftentimes, St. Innocent says in one of his uh, letters, he says that God has fashioned for each person a special cross. He says some are made of gold, some are made of silver, some aluminum, some wood, some this, some that. But he says, but God has given every one of us very specifically tailor-made perfect crosses for us through which we can find resurrection, through which we can know God, through which we can find salvation. And a lot of times we don't like them. The difficulties in our life, the death of a loved one, the death of a mother early on in our childhood, difficulties at home, financial troubles, endless could be the variety, and yet those difficulties oftentimes that we've been given in our life Everyone in this room has some kind of special thing that basically they say, gosh, I really wish I didn't have this thing. I really wish that I didn't have to deal with this. I really wish I didn't have this weakness, this flaw, this sensitivity, this problem in my childhood, this difficulty in my life that's been seemed to be going on now forever and ever and ever. That is your specially tailored cross through which, if with embraced with faith, can manifest the very life of God himself. Because this life is temporary, it's very passing, you know. We only have today, that's about all we get. It's all we're certain about. I have today right now, and even then it's a little uncertain because, you know, I'm tired and stuff like that. I might, you know, I could collapse at any moment. It's highly unlikely, but the reality is, is that right now is a gift from God. And like Family Circus said, you know, the little cartoonist says, today is a gift, and that's why they call it the present. I always remember that because it's good. I also remember the one where I had the little one that said, uh-oh, uh, mommy, the oops truck is here again. They forgot something. It's a UPS man. 
you know, I think he, he was definitely a Christian, just like uh, the, the, the uh, Charles Schultz was as well. But this life of prayer is the inheritance that the church gives to us today. It has perfect prayer. You know, they talk about saints having perfect prayer. And that the fact that if you were to increase in this stature of the fullness of God, you too would encounter perfect prayer. The great thing about it is this, is that <clears throat> all of us are not necessarily, well, St. John Climacus has a wonderful quote. He says, um, all people cannot reach the height of sanctity and passionlessness like the saints. However, all can be reconciled to God and saved. So we may not encounter that perfect prayer in our own lives deep inside. However, the great fact is, is that it's in the church already. It's in the liturgy already. We just have to open up to that phenomenon and make a little bit of it our own. It's perfect prayer, which is prayer for the entire world on behalf of all and for all so that we live that mystery of all people everywhere in our own hearts. And through that, we encounter Christ who bears that on behalf of the entire world. He really does carry the whole world, the life of the world. And so the monasteries are these places of prayer. And like St. Siloan says, when real and true prayer cease, then the end of the world will come. And there's some kind of like uh, interesting folk tradition in some uh, ethnic um, areas of the world that says, on the day that no one anywhere celebrates the liturgy, like all liturgies canceled and we're not going to do it anywhere at all, he says that's when Christ will come. That's just a little side note. Because the reality is, is that it's precisely prayer that upholds the world. And so monasteries are places, you know, we do a lot of work, we have a lot of activities, we do publishing, we do this, we do that, but the main work of a monastery is prayer on behalf of all and for all, especially this place called America in which we all live. And no matter where I go, I encounter St. Tikhon's, whether it's in your priest, Father Theophon, whether it's in Alaska with somebody there that was ordained millions of years ago at St. Tikhon's, whether it's wherever I go, there seems to be a little bit of that reminder that St. Tikhon's is present because St. Tikhon of Moscow, 1905, founded that monastery because he knew it was an absolute necessity for the life of the church in America. Five canonized saints have lived, walked, taught, and been at St. Tikhon's Monastery, St. Tikhon of Moscow, who spent an entire summer there. They said he loved uh, helping with the bees, and he liked to swim in the lake. And he also didn't want any of the potatoes with the skins off, because, you know, the cook would especially, because he's a bishop, especially take all the skins off of his potatoes. He said, don't do that for me. I want the skins on just like the brothers. I will eat the skins. So he was very uh, amenable, very kind, very humble. In fact, all of these saints that we had at our monastery kind of show us the way how to live in our modern world today. St. Sophroni has an interesting quote. He says, saints from the third and the fourth century will not be the ones that we are judged against. The saints of our modern time and of our modern place, they will be the, the measure against which God says, hmm, how did you do? And what does St. Tikhon of Moscow show us? He shows us the utmost of humility. He himself was, of course, a bishop in America from, I, best, I bet, 1898, something like that, to 1907 when he was recalled. Then he went back to Russia. He became the first patriarch of Russia in 1917 amidst the greatest turmoil and chaos that the world has probably known the breakdown of the Russian Empire, that was when he was elected. We actually have his mantia that he was elected in at the monastery that he wore when they enthroned him as the patriarch of all Russia, the first in 200 years. And at every cross, he bowed his head and said, okay, I accept. Showing us a perfect example of humility. He wasn't, uh, you know, we didn't talk about how much vigils he kept or how much even like, all of the details of ascetic life that you could talk about some, for some of the earlier fathers and so forth. It was just that when the cross came and that God's will, he said, may it be blessed, may it be done. Bowing his head, saying, okay, I accept. And so often leaving for us that same example that when the cross comes to us, no matter what form it may be in, and we will all have them. We all have them already and we will have more because it's precisely that through those crosses that we find resurrection. 
It's the opportunity for growth. And the most important thing we can think about when we look at the cross is it's a big plus sign. There's no negative part in the cross. It's all positive. If we can embrace it with trust, faith, hope, and prayer, and persevere to the end. That's a difficult word, but you know, it works. It really does work. And so St. Egon of Moscow, this great image of humility, of how to just accept what God gives us. As from God, no matter how difficult or no matter what it is, okay, I accept this, Lord, as from your hands, and now I will add in my part of faith, my part of love, my part of hope, my part of prayer. And through it, I know that all things work for the greater good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. St. Alexis of Wilkesbury, who, through his work, he was at the monastery. Uh, he passed away, I think, in repose, 1911, something like that. Great, ardent supporter of the monastery, loved the monastery, thought it was the best thing that happened since, uh, who knows? He was single-handedly uh, responsible for bringing in from his work the parishes that he brought in and all of the, the people that came in through that, 400,000 people into the Orthodox Church. And all he did on a basic level, because he was a real tough guy, you know, he had to deal with a lot of stuff. All, the main thing that he did was he confessed the Orthodox faith in the face of great adversity, in the face of great trial, in the face of every kind of malevolence, he still held, held fast to his faith. That's, that's the main thing he did. He's called a confessor and defender of orthodoxy in America. That's what he's known for. He's not known for anything else. Showing to us to cleave to the faith. Because really, faith is kind of a very subtle phenomenon. It's something that's rather fragile. It can be broken. It can be lost. We can forget where we put it. Um, it's not something that is tangible and easily quantifiable by any kind of scientific or otherwise uh, means. It's a difficult, it's, it, it's difficult to talk about. At the end of the day, we could say faith is basically a mystery. And it's my response to God who calls, who's always calling us. God is always calling. And the fact is, is that my response to him is the most important thing that I can offer it. And that precisely when I respond, that's what generates the light of faith. I'm responding to the person of God who calls, and through that, light and faith are generated. I think St. Isaac said somewhere, faith, let's see, faith is the light that comes from grace. So it's in precisely when we encounter the grace of God and we respond, that that light is generated within us, and we say, ah, yes, no man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's such a subtle matter. So much so that St. Silouan says that it's not a small thing to be called a Christian. It's not a small thing. It means that the Holy Spirit is acting in you to be able to confess and to believe, to know, to understand, and to continue to move forward. It's not a small thing. Not a small thing that any of us are here today. Not a small thing. That light of faith that comes to us through that confession is unto salvation. It's the mystery of God working inside of us and leading us forward in a way that's very much not of a head knowledge. You know, orthodoxy principally is a religion of the heart. And how to understand that my head and my heart are not always working together quite too well. And that at the fall, we could really see that the preeminence of the heart was usurped by more or less the insanity of the head. The head has its right place, the mind, as it were, but it's in the heart. Orthodoxy tries in its most clear and uh, proficient way to explain how to put the mind back into the heart and stand before the face of God. That is the definition, the textbook definition of prayer. How to stand with your mind in your heart before the face of God. And it's interesting because if you think about it, which one is higher just physically, and it's very symbolic in a way, which one is higher, your head or your heart? The head's all the way up here. It's like, hey, I'm way up here. I can see everything, huh? And the heart's down here. It's like, I'm so lowly. I'm just at the bottom. And I, I was talking to somebody the other day. It's even, you know, when they make a symbol of the heart, you know, there's a little point that goes down. <laughs> even says, like, there's a certain humility to being able to live in the heart, 
to be in the heart and to abide from that place of the heart informed by the head. Because you can't do, you can't, it's not like one or the other. It's just a matter of hierarchy. And that hierarchy was um, disturbed by the fall. And now St. Nikolai of Zicha says that man with the candle of his reason is constantly investigating phenomenon and he has one candle to look at everything with. He's trying to figure everything out. Right? Trying to see, oh, yeah, that's a tree. Right? It's, we, that's how the head functions. But with the light of grace, it transcends all of that and it gives light to the entire world. It is the spiritual light of which Christ is preeminently the, the son of righteousness. He is the light of the world. It's living in that place and understanding things from that place, which as it was intended by God at the creation of the world. So this mystery of how the mind and the heart are supposed to work together is, is the question that orthodox spirituality answers. How do they work together? How do we get this thing back together and organized so that my head doesn't kill me? Because sometimes we're so busy monologuing with ourselves, we totally forget about God, you know? I'm so busy talking to myself sometimes, I have to tell myself to shut up. Why? Because otherwise, I lose sight of what's important. I become so isolated and insular, and I'm not oftentimes seeing things as they really are. How many times have you been upset with somebody? In your head, it's like, this is what they did, this is what happened, I can't believe that they said that. How terrible, you get all worked up, and then you go to the person and say, blah, and they're like, oh, not even like that. That's not even happening. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Well, I thought that this and that and the other, and then they go, no, hold on. Then they give you the story and you're like, oh, sorry. That's the head kind of running off, right? Spiritual life gives us the ability to be responsive rather than reactive. And the only way responsivity comes is through a life of consistent prayer. If there was anything I could tell you today because I'm from a far off land called Pennsylvania <laughs> and you won't really remember me anyways in a few months, say, what was that guy? He was there, he's all black he's from some monastery somewhere and he brought something so what did he say I can't remember he says I'm gonna tell you right now what I what I'm gonna tell you to remember you have to pray there is an inner world in the monastery we learn about this inner world so well that we become kind of like technicians of this inner life just as there is an outer life we go, we move around, get in our car, drive to the store, whatever we do, we get a job, all that stuff. There's an inner life, and it's just as real, if not more real, and even larger. Let me read you something from uh, St. Macarius that I always like to ponder myself. St. Macarius is uh, one of those uh, saints in the desert. Uh, and uh, basically, he talks about the heart. And the heart is... If we're going to say anything about orthodoxy, the, the one word that we could say that epitomizes orthodoxy at its core is the word person. Okay? The word person. The word person kind of contains orthodoxy in a nutshell. Because the revelation of God in the church is person. The person of Jesus Christ, who reveals the person of the Father through the action of the person of the Holy Spirit. And in their light, we see the light of who we are as person. And person also ultimately denotes mystery. If you were to say to yourself, like, what are you? I don't know, I'm a person. Well, what is that? Well, we could say that means to be made in the image of God, which principally is defined by the word freedom. We have absolute freedom to choose whatever we want, even hell itself. That God-like freedom was given to us by God himself. And when uh, St. Sophroni says something very powerful, he says, when God made man, he made nothing less than himself. They call man microtheos, mini-gods. Of course, created, God is uncreated, we're created. There's no mistake there, no kind of, you know, there's a strong line there. 
that side and that side. God's uncreated, he's God. We're created, we're not God. However, when God made man, he made nothing less than himself. That is the honor and the dignity that he gave to us. Even so much so that St. Gregory Palma says that man is, is a, a greater world within a lesser world. Like you yourself are a greater world than the lesser world outside, he says. And so much so that he says that uh, even one soul, one person is more value and of more kind of uh, innate kind of uh, mystery than the entire cosmos, the entire universe. So, if we say that person is the, 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 the mystery, right, and you are a person, 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 and I'm a person, we're all person, right? All these mysteries walking around, <laughs> little mysteries, you know, even a little baby mystery over there. <laughs> the epicenter of that, the, the very center of that phenomenon of person is the heart. Where is the center of the person if not the heart? And the center of the heart is the noose, which is the eye of the soul, by which we kind of understand the world and so forth. And the noose, really, if you want to, if you want to, the layman's term, which I like myself, is the noose is where, wherever your noose is, well, wherever your attention is, that's where your noose is. Simple, right? Oh, noose, I don't know, noose. It's like wherever your attention is, if it's right now on Amazon shopping while you're listening to me, guess where your noose is at? It's at the store. It's in your car, wondering if you've locked the car. Your noose is in your car. You've got to bring it inside. <laughs> so, if we are a religion of the heart, and if the center of the person is the heart, I don't know if we can adequately say that we understand what the heart is. Why? Because it is such a great phenomenon that the greater part of it is unknown to us, even myself. And I just kind of scratch the surface in the monastery and I say, oh my goodness. Look at the abyss. St. Macarius says this to say, <clears throat> Within your heart there are unfathomable depths. Now let's see, back up a little bit. By the way, your heart is at one and the same time both spiritual and material. This world is at one and the same time both spiritual and material. They co-inhere within each other. They are not opposites. They are not antithetical. This is not the material world, and that's the spiritual world up there. This is the spiritual world, which is material, because God made it, and God dwells in everything. In him we live and move and have our being, St. Paul says. In this world, this world is deeply spiritual. It's just how to, through asceticism and the life of the, the sacramental life, the mystical sacramental life of the church, how to lift the veil of this world and to see it for what it really is. As St. Gregory Palama says, the entire world is a burning bush of God's energies. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. It also says that the invisible things of him are clearly seen and known, even his eternal Godhead and his power through the things that are made. Romans 1, 20. Through the things that are made, we understand the great majesty of God. I love looking at stars. The new James Webb Telescope, it just makes me crazy. I get all excited, I have all the pictures on my phone. I don't know if there's anybody else like that, but I have all of them. Every time they come up, I eat them up like they're chocolate. You know, it's so cool. <laughs> it's amazing. These things are so far away and they're so vast, so beautiful. It's like. To me, like there's, you know, I was studied uh, astronomy in college. It was very atheistic in one way. It was very sterile and cold. It was just, you know, the worst. But now I don't really care about that. It's like, how can you not see God in that? It's so amazing. It's just for me, it's, it's like an icon, you know, just out there, steady in here. So when we're talking about the heart, you know, it's like, now, Father Jerome used to say, you know, if you can't find, well, let's see. If you can't find Jesus in your heart, you're not going to find him if you go to Jerusalem. You know, we're, we were thinking about going to Jerusalem one year. And that's really it. It's like, if I am looking for God, guess what, folks? Where am I going to knock at the door? 
if not my own heart? Where am I going to go if not my own heart? And in fact, the most principal and elemental and ne necessary spiritual movement of which there is like no other question is given to us in the, the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son shows us this uh, how-to of spiritual living. Everybody knows the prodigal son, right? He's in a far land. He was in this great place. And he goes off in the far land. He has all of the, the terrible disaster of, of being in famine and want and need. And right before he goes back to the Father's house, which is an image of us returning to God, which is an image of heaven, what does it say in the text? He came to himself. He had to do that first before he went back. And I can't tell you enough because it's counterintuitive and I can't explain it like concisely enough. You just have to believe me and try it yourself. But in order to go to God, you need to go first back to yourself. You need to physically put your attention back into your own heart and then begin to speak to God. Because as Father Zechariah says, if we don't do this, we will be speaking to God outside of our heart, which is outside of heaven, which is outside of our Father's house. So there is a, a mechanical movement that is of utmost necessity when we are trying to pray. St. John Damascus says it in this way. He says, in order to have communion with God, we need to first have communion with ourselves. A lot of times we're so pulled out by the phenomenon of life, the distractions of life, the insanity of life, we get dissociated from ourselves. So much so that sometimes we even have to have medication because we're so far away that even it could cause a, a break, a mental break where we actually snap in half and we're so far outside ourselves that we're broken. We're like, where did I go? What happened? This is the phenomenon of the fall working itself out in real time. And so, as simple and as, as uh, seemingly kind of unnecessary as it might be, if I'm going to pray rightly and if I'm going to pray well, the first movement I need to do is to make an, a, an actual movement back to myself and to my heart and from there to speak to God. Putting my physical noose attention into my physical heart, which is at one and the same time spiritual and material. I don't know if I would get a heart transplant. It depends on how old I would be. But I know that a lot of people that have had them, sometimes they start talking about new hobbies, <laughs> new interests. They really like sports now. They really like this. They really, you know, there is an, a spiritual aspect to everything that is material. You're a cardiologist, right, Mark? <laughs> have you ever seen it? Yeah. Yeah, a little different. <laughs> So it's just, it is a true phenomenon in the sense of the fact that our heart is where we are at. Um, so just like the prodigal son, because we're all kind of distracted, which is kind of prodigality, you know, the first uh, step towards sin is basically distraction, you know, and we all fight against sin. It's nothing, it's a universal problem, various forms, lower, higher, whatever. Um, the first movement back to God is a movement back to my own physical heart, my attention back to my heart. And then from that place, I say, Lord, hear my prayer. If I don't do that, oftentimes I'll just be blah blahing. And God says, what? I, I can't hear. Hello? Is there anybody on the phone? You know, it's like it rings, but there's nobody there. That's the essence of what happens when we just start to pray without actually connecting to ourselves. And don't think that you're in communion with yourself. It takes a good 40 minutes of just sitting there and being quiet for me to come back to me for in, in my life. It's not something that's a given. It's not something that's a given. I, I liken it to feeling sometimes like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, remember that stuff that they used to have where it was like that jello stuff that was like in a jar. You put it out and it would kind of like go everywhere and you had a hard time getting it back into the can. It was like for kids. I'm from the you know, we had stuff like that because it was probably dangerous and we didn't know. But, you know, it had eyes on it sometimes. It was just really weird. But I just think of it like that. It's like so often we're just pulled out of ourselves in so many different directions by trauma, difficulty, work, whatever you name it. To get us back into that can, it takes quite a bit of work. It doesn't just happen. 
If we allow for it, it will. And that's why people go on retreats. You know, I highly recommend going to a monastery, whether it's St. Tikhon's or uh, Holy Transfiguration or maybe a local Greek monastery or whatever. Give yourself that time, not only on a daily basis to be able to return to yourself and be present to God, but also to give yourself a little bit more time and even go further in that process because it is so necessary. The more difficult that the world becomes, the more necess of a necessity it is. So, back to St. Marcarius. He says, The heart governs and reigns over the whole bodily organism. And when grace possesses the ranges of the heart, it rules over all the members and thoughts. Within the heart are unfathomable depths. In the heart, your heart, are reception rooms and bedchambers, doors and porches, many offices and passages. In it is the workshop of righteousness and the workshop of wickedness. In it is death and in it is life. The heart is Christ's palace and there Christ the King comes to take his rest with the angels and the spirits of the saints. He dwells there, walks within it, and places his kingdom there. The heart is but a small vessel, and yet dragons and lions are there. Poisonous creatures and all the treasuries of wickedness, rough, uneven paths are there, <coughs> and gaping chasms. But there likewise is God, there the angels, their life and the kingdom, their light and the apostles, the heavenly cities, and all the treasuries of grace, for all things are in your heart. And that's a mystery. I won't proclaim to, to, to know it. However, finding the deep heart is the essence of what true spiritual life is. And it's not something that just happens overnight or even in a, one retreat or in one moment. It takes decades. However, if we have a consistent life of prayer, we'll talk about that in a minute, that small and steady effort it's like kind of like uh, the, the very, uh, it's like the widow's might. It purchases for, us, purchases, purchases for us the kingdom. And the principal way and the easiest way to start doing that is through the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is not some kind of magic talism or talisman. It's not a mantra. It's the very name of God, which in the Old Testament you could not say. Shh, don't say it. They just spelled it with four letters. Shh. They didn't want to say it. It's too holy. And in fact, it was kind of unknown, so it was a little scary. And even now, sometimes people that are, are like on Manathos and they're kind of technicians of the Jesus prayer, they get to a point sometimes where they can't even say it because it's just too much. They realize what it is and it freaks them out to the very core of their being and they get so undone that they have to stop. Because it is the very name of God. No other name given in, under heaven and earth by which we must be saved. And at this name, every knee must bow, every tongue must confess, every demon must bow, every demon must confess, every passion in your soul must bow, every passion in your soul must confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. There is nothing stronger. There is no other name given under heaven. It is the very name of God. And so, but it's not some kind of magic kind of formula, you know? But it does have an energy with it, just like every word that we say has energy. You know, if I said a bad word right now, everybody would be like, oh my gosh, has a terrible energy, right? If I say good words to you, it fills you with good energy. And in fact, you know me through my energies. You will never know me through my essence. This is an easy distinction for us to understand essence and energies, you know. St. Gregory Palmas talks about that every second Sunday of Great Lent. In my essence, in my soul, you will never know me in my deeper parts like I know me. However, you will know me through my energies because I'm talking to you right now. I'm moving my hands. I'm discussing spiritual phenomena. It's charged with energy. And more or less, you know, like, have you ever, has anybody misspelled your last name ever? <laughs> you know, people do that to me all the time. I am very particular about my last name because it is my last name. And you want it to be just right. Like they say, is that, is that okay? It's like, no, it's not okay. Let me, <laughs> no, no, my name. And if somebody mispronounced the last name, huh? <laughs> it's, I am in my name. 
Whether I like it or not, I'm very protective of it. More or less, you know. Depending on, you know, the day. In the same way, God is present in His name. And so if I understand how the Jesus prayer works, which is basically, again, it's a tool for me to look inside my heart and to be able to, to, to become sensible to the presence of God, not through the words, but ultimately through the stillness, through that quiet place that I cultivate in my heart as I carefully, quietly, and slowly say it, maybe five, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes a day, whatever it is, you know, the easiest thing to do is this. It's like I say, if you don't know what to do, so I've never done this before, just do five minutes of the Jesus prayer in the morning and read a chapter from the gospel. Just start with that. And be consistent. Be consistent. Who couldn't pray for, you know, seven minutes, right? I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it's that, it is that hard sometimes. You say, oh, I can't do that. It's like St. Sophroni said, it's easier to build skyscrapers than it is to pray properly and to pray, con like, ongoing prayer. It's a very difficult thing because everything fights against us when we start doing it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to pray and it's like, and they like, bring, bring my phone, bring, bring, you know, all these alarms start going off and, you know, people start dying outside and windows break and dogs bark and, you know, um, it's just, it's phenomenal like how much this world seems to be against spiritual life. I don't know, is it prejudiced? I don't know. It's like, What's going on here? What? And it's precisely through those phenomenon that we understand what the spiritual world is. We don't ever understand spiritual things directly. You know? God's activity is almost always like we see it like in a side mirror. We say, oh, that was God. He worked this thing out for me and this is what happened. It's like, oh yeah. Or like, let's say like this icon right here. Um, Inevitably, when a miracle working icon comes to a parish, like somebody has to get deathly ill or have to, you know, have some kind of problem, some kind of pain. You know, I've, I can't tell you how many times it's like I'm on my way to the parish and, you know, parish priest all of a sudden gets in a car accident or this happens this or this is some kind of catastrophe happens. It's like, oh my gosh, what is going on in this world? This is a crazy world. Seems to be against the things of God. And yet God made this world. Reality is, is that there's some dark and evil spirits that also inhabit this world and they fight against the things of God. It's just the way it is. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to freak out about it. I'm not going to give it the time of day. Why? The more I pay attention to it, it's kind of like a car accident. You know, you're going to crash into something else. You don't, if you, if you see a car accident on the side of the road, you just keep moving. Don't stare at it. Don't give it more energy. Don't cause more problems by kind of fixating on the phenomenon. That's what they want. Like, let's say you have a bad thought. You want to kill someone or something like that. It's terrible. But sometimes that happens in our head. A lot of times that comes from the outside. St. Maximus says thoughts are from three things. They, they can either come from our own nature, which is about maybe 40% of the time. Our guardian angel, which is about 5 to 7% of the time. Maybe 10, I don't know. And then the rest of the bad thoughts that come to us actually come from the radio of our head being interfered with by dark and evil spirits. Some of them more, some of them less. You know, bad thoughts come from bad places. I'm sorry. And we have to learn how to reject them. We have to either learn how to ignore them, which is the easiest way to do it. Say a Jesus prayer. Or say no. Because just because you had that thought doesn't mean it's yours. Very important. Very, very important. Not every thought that you have is yours, and not every thought that you have is, is, is from God or from your own nature. It comes from outside sometimes. Thought of suicide is always from the devil. I'm sorry. We don't have the ontological makeup to be able to say, I want to hurt myself in that way. It's against our nature. Even Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's, uh, you know, this is the big theological conundrum uh, that was answered by St. Maximus, why does Christ say to the, to the Father, if at all possible, take this cup from me? In his human nature, he says that because our ontology is for life. We were not created for death. The Old Testament says that very clearly in the book of Sirach. It said, God does not delight in the death of the living because God did not make death. That is the truth of orthodoxy. 
that is the truth that we can affirm with categoric certainty. Why? Because every time we bring somebody into the church and there's a funeral, we look at it and say, what happened? I don't understand this. This doesn't make any sense at all. What is happening right now? And it never really is okay. Except in the light of the resurrection, except in the light of the promises of Christ, except in God's presence, who gives life to all things, even those who are dead. Death is not natural. And St. Sophroni and Father Zacharias, who I'm the kind of, uh, they are my uh, spiritual mindset. The, the monastery has always actually been connected. One of our other saints, I never quite finished all my stories, one of our other saints is St. Saint Nikolai of Zicha. St. Nikolai of Zicha was a Serbian bishop who came to America. He was in a concentration camp in 1942-ish. Came to America in 44, 45, and taught at St. Tikhon's uh, and Jordanville, and then eventually resided at St. Tikhon's from about, ooh, he was the rector from 51 to 55. And St. Uh, Nikolai, he was always in contact with St. Silouan. And St. Silouan was the spiritual father of St. Sophroni. And St. Nikolai of Zicha ordained St. Sophroni deacon on Manathos. So we've always had kind of this tie to the monastery in Essex, which is where St. Sophroni reposed in his monastery they created in 1959. Father Zacharias, his heir, if he was like, what should I read? Read books by Father Zacharias, especially book, the, the book called Remember Thy First Love, which is a great spiritual catechis, uh, catechism. Remember Thy First Love. It's a wonderful book about the spiritual stages and how it all works. But that thought process in St. Sophronius and Father Zacharias, he said this, if we accept death as something which is natural, it's like normal, and it's okay, on, in, he says, we will vanish in oblivion. He says, however, if we see it as the, last en the first and the last enemy that needs to be destroyed and overcome, it is only then that we can share in Christ's victory of the resurrection today. It's so important for us to be able to see our lives as, a, as something where we need to fight for life in our own hearts. If there's any thoughts that come into us that are of the nature of death, we need to ignore them, pray, uh, turn away from them. We need to say no to them. We need to go to confession for them, whatever it is that we can do. But those are not us. We need to be something else, and it will always be a struggle, and that's okay. But this concept of being able to embrace life, it is the essence of orthodoxy. It's the life of the world to come today. That's what the church offers to us. So Father, uh, the hierarch, Hierotheos of Lajos, he says something like this. He says, we Orthodox Christians are not uh, waiting for the second coming, but we're living the life expected after the second coming today. That's the life that's in the church. That's the life that's in the sacraments. That is the mystery of what a saint really is, is somehow they have actualized the kingdom in themselves. That world which is to come is present in them today. And they are kind of like the boundary between the two worlds. And they bring them together and they, they, they somehow manifest it to us. They live in that world and this world. Even like St. Paul says that I have a desire to depart, to be with the Lord, and yet it is much more expedient for me to be with you. He saw that light which is the kingdom. He saw that light, that light which was on Mount Tabor, that same light which shone in Moses' face when he came down after he was speaking to the Lord, and it says he, he spoke with one as would speak with a friend, and he shone with that light which he had to cover himself and veil himself because they couldn't bear that light. Prophet Isaiah saw that light, when God was seated on his throne in Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel saw that light when he saw the likeness of a man on the likeness of a throne that was the likeness of God, which was Jesus pre-incarnate. St. Paul saw that light. He was knocked off of his horse. And he said to the light, Who art thou, Lord God, Adonai? And the light said, I'm Jesus. And the great saints of our time, like St. Siloan and St. Sophroni, saw that same light. They talk about it in great detail. It's that same light. It's that same kingdom. It's that same vision of God. 
It's that same world to come which is here today, and that's what the church is. It's called inaugurated eschatology. It means that the kingdom is present and yet to be culminated. It's already here. Christ comes and he says, he resumes the dialogue that was broken in the garden, and he says, what's the first word out of his mouth? He says, change your mind. Metanoia, repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's in his person. It's in the mystery of Christ's person that the fullness of the kingdom dwells in that light, which is the world to come. The saints experience that light, and only one or two or three or maybe up to like 10 in a generation experience that light, and it's enough for the rest of us. Because it's that bright, and it's that powerful, it's that overwhelming that most of us couldn't bear it. We would fall down and melt, you know, like I would just melt away like butter. Say goodnight, Father Sergius. You know, it's, it is something which we can't even explain or understand and very few of us could bear. But it's precisely the cross in our own life, whatever difficulties you may be experiencing right now today. Say, oh, I just can't deal with that. That cross that God has given you today that enables us to bear that light. Because the presence of God is a consuming fire. And at the second coming, when that unendurable brightness and that unendurable light of which St. Nicholas says, the force of which will raise the dead, it will be so strong and powerful, it is precisely the cross that we carry in our own lives that enables us to bear, to bear that light today and in the world to come when we actually meet the Lord. It tempers us. It enables us to deal with it because it is too much for human nature. You see that in the Old Testament where people just die. They kind of, they get in God's presence and they're like, ah, and they melt. You know, remember anybody seen uh, Indiana Jones in the Lost Ark? Remember all those melting people? And they, they, Indiana Jones covered his eyes. Why? Because they didn't want to have to see that light. It was just too much. I know it's a very, you know, kind of base uh, example. However, it works. It works. St. John Climacus says that super celestial light at one and the same time illumines and burns. It illumines and burns. Depends on our own disposition. Sometimes Pascha is very bright. You know, I've had some pretty miserable Pascha's. I don't know about you, because that light's too bright and I'm just not in the best place. And other times I'm filled with joy and it's just wonderful and wondrous. It's a great opportunity. I'm just so glad to be there. And other times it's like hell itself. Sometimes I have been in the furnace of the altar cooking like a chicken. Why? Because I'm not in the right place. St. Isaac says something very interesting. He says that God himself is heaven for the saints and hell for the sinners. The love of God is at one time the same for each. God's love is precisely what that heaven is and precisely what that light is. And if we are not rightly disposed to it, it will not be a happy moment for us. It's the disposition of our own heart that determines our fate in eternity, not some wave of God's wand that says, I'm sorry, you know, I've judged you now and you're going to go over there. We judge ourselves. And that's why St. Paul says, if we would judge ourselves, we won't be judged. Because we've already worked it all out. Cleaned house. Made things right. Said forgive me to people that are long-standing forgiveness. Worked out, gone to confession and said those things that we never wanted to say ever, 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 and yeah, we did it. It's out, done, over. God's forgiven, I've moved on. A lot of times we have that. You know, you, you say, I can't, I can't confess that. And it's like, well, you know what? You're going to hold on to it then. It, I think sometimes more it's for us than it is for God. God doesn't need to be like placated as if he was mad at us. We need to say it so that we can get it out there and move on and receive the communion of life, which kind of we've isolated ourselves against by our obstinacy of saying no. It's a very subtle matter, but we all have it. We all experience that. So it's the mystery of the heart. So through the cross to the light, through our own cross to the light of the resurrection, through our own cross, the difficulties of our day, to the light of the kingdom, and to be able to say yes to God, to say yes to our neighbor, no matter what you know, the difficulty is with our spouse, our children. You know, a yes to the other more often is a yes to God. Not always. You know, we do need to have our own integrity and so forth. But more often than not, you know, prefer the other person's will in small things because it will only be to your benefit, especially if it's out of love's sake, for Christ's sake. 
So that life of prayer that I just want to talk about briefly, because I know everybody's getting tired now. Is there coffee service, just like on Manathos? And our all-afternoon vigil? <laughs> um, that most important part is consistency in prayer, and to use the Jesus prayer as a tool. Jesus' prayer is something that is a mystery, but we do need to use the body when we uh, try to pray. Using the body, you know, the kingdom of heaven is literally within. He didn't say it's kind of within. He didn't say it's sort of within. He didn't say, oh, it's kind of like, there was no metaphor there. The kingdom of God is literally inside you right now. And why is it there? Because most of us were baptized. So that grace of baptism and that newness of life, which is kind of the, kind of it, it, it encompasses like the fullness of the work of Christ in baptism, somehow in that little capsule that was given to us and put inside of our heart. And it's like a spark. And all we have to do is blow on that spark every day and get it a little bit brighter, clean off the dust a little bit more, and let it burn just a little more each day by blowing on it through our converse with God. And really the essence of prayer, like there's a couple of textbook definitions which are really good. One of them is, is, is the easiest way to understand prayer is this. Prayer is converse and union with God. This is St. John Climacus's definition. Prayer is a conversation that we have with God that affects our union with God and this union is salvation. We don't believe in some kind of juridical stamp where by God says, okay, you're saved. Oh, sorry over there. No, no, not in the back here. Uh, yes, you are okay. Doesn't happen like that. It's precisely through our conversation that we have with God that affects our union with God. And as St. Peter reminds us in the second, second epistle, first chapter somewhere, he said, and to you are giving exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature. This is orthodox view of salvation. It's our conversation that we have with God on a daily basis that affects our union with God. And if there's anything that I'm selling today, it's not about any kind of fluff or any kind of thing about orthodoxy or whatever. It's just this. You need to put prayer into your life and you need to put it first. If it's not first, it will be last. And it really is that important. If prayer affects our union with God, how else will it happen if we don't do it? If it's that necessary, sure, it's easy to come and open our mouth at communion, but are we ready? Are we prepared? Have we cleaned the house inside? Have we made ready for the guest, as it were? Is there an appropriate vessel? You know, you wouldn't take your morning cup of coffee that had milk in it from last night that you didn't rinse out first. You wouldn't leave it in there in the, you know, you see, I, have, I don't have a dishwasher at home, so, you know, you put that cup in there. I'm not gonna put something in there. I gotta wash it. How in the world would we not try to clean up a little bit inside before we receive the Lord himself? All that milk stain inside or whatever it might be, bitterness, resentment, upsetness, depression, whatever it might be that we're struggling with that we need to kind of work on or look at or identify. Prayer first. Prayer is an absolute necessity. There is nothing more important in this world than prayer and that's why it's so hard. It's easier for me to build a building at St. Tikhon's Monastery than it is for me to pray. Oh, do I have to go to church again? Oh, it's like my shoes have lead in them. Ah, oh, ah, ah. Get to my stall in the morning, crawl into my stall. Ah, ah, it's painful to be there. Why? It's God's presence. God's presence is sometimes painful. It's a cross for us. It is a revelation of how God's life is, what it's like, and what it is like for us. It tells everything, the cross. It shows us everything, the cross. You know, Christ is stretched out on it, and he says, they nail here, and they nail there. He says, I'm, my feet are nailed to show you that I'm not going anywhere. And my hands are outstretched so much that it shows that I will never reject you or, or, or not receive you. Come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He shows, it's like the most vulnerable position. Here is the Lord of glory. Available, open, ready to receive us, ready to forgive us, ready to love us, never to leave us. 
This is the mystery of God. And so when we use the Jesus Prayer, again, it's a tool. It's a tool to look within. It's nice to make a few prostrations. You know, I call it the five and five. So you say the Trisagion if you want, or you can just start with the Jesus Prayer. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you can have some flexibility in this. It doesn't have to be some kind of rule. It's about having a relationship. I would just suggest a specific amount of time. Ten minutes. If you've never done anything, ten minutes is a great place to start. Who couldn't pray for ten minutes, right? You just tell yourself, oh, let's pray for ten minutes. A lot of times you'll be able to pray for more than that. But like when I'm really tired and don't want to do my prayer rule, I'll just pray for 10 minutes. And you know what? I end up doing more of it than I thought I would. So I say, I'm just going to pray for 10 minutes. And then maybe I do a few prostrations. I call it the five and five. I just do five prostrations with the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And I go all the way down the ground. I use my body to pray because it connects me back to myself. I can't be disincarnate in this whole process of prayer. Otherwise, I'm just going to be kind of like fantasizing at the end of it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Five prostrations. My back is terrible, so sometimes it really is uh, painful, but I think it's more effective that way. Um, and I just go really slow. And even if you can't do that, you could just use your body and say, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, and just touch the floor and bow down before the Lord, who is everywhere. And then, using a prayer rope, again, using the body, five 10, 15 minutes, whatever you could do. The main thing is this, is that you don't want to use the Jesus prayer as some kind of end in and of itself. You say, oh, I did the Jesus prayer for 10 minutes, now I'm good. It's like, no, there is a goal. <clears throat> and it's not necessarily just to say the prayer. It's about how to become vivified and have a spiritual sensation of God's presence within us. This takes a long time to cultivate, but I can tell you with certainty, it is for sure. If you continue consistently in it, it will happen. Why? Because that baptismal grace inside of you will be rubbed. It will become brighter. It, the more area will be cleared. And you will be able to have that sense of, oh, there is a little bit of light in me. And this gives us hope. This gives us direction. And this gives us peace. There is no other place to get this. You can't buy this stuff. You cannot buy it. So I use my prayer rope. And I just say, Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And I pause. You know, say, Elder Milino says, God is in the pause. So I allow for some space and some, a little bit of silence or stillness in my prayer. Because it's in that silence that I'm ultimately going to hear and know and understand the words of the psalmist who says, Be still and what? So we know God how? Oh, that's kind of weird, isn't it? You have to kind of th I thought I had to think my way into heaven sometimes, you know? Hmm, I think about God enough, then I'm going to get there. No, it's like dreaming that you went to work, and then you have to get up, and you're like, oh, great. I was at work in my dream, and now I have to go. You know, it's kind of like that. You get all this effort in your head, nothing happened. Nothing actually happened. Why? Because it has to happen in real time. So I say, Lord Jesus Christ. I don't say it very loud. I just use, I move my mouth. And I say it so I can hear it, but that nobody else can hear it. And I say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And I can also use it as a, a little bit more flexible. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon my spouse. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon my children. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon that terrible co-worker that I don't like. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon my enemies, my friends, my re whoever. Use it as a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us and upon thy world. Pray. Do it. It works. It works. I'm like, please. I am so serious about this. Like, this is what I do all day, but nobody, I get a shot for the, <laughs> for the calendar. Nobody believes me sometimes. You know, I say, oh yeah, that's right. No, no. This is the answer. Like, Real contact with God, it happens here, deep inside, but it has to be consistent daily, and some effort needs to be expended towards it, otherwise it won't ever happen. We say, oh yeah, I didn't think it worked. Did you try? No. Why not? I don't know. Do it. Please. Try it. I Just try it for a month. Ten minutes, okay? I'll make, you can contact me if it didn't work. You go through the website. If you have prayer requests too, you can do that as well. We have guest house. 
There's also a complaint department. I'm one in the same. It's all the same. <laughs> if it doesn't work, I'll send you the five bucks back, okay? Or whatever it is that you put into the donation thing. <laughs> Try it. After you say the Jesus prayer for five or ten minutes, and you're just using your prayer rope, and you're doing it with just a little bit of stillness, just try the five minutes if you can't do much. You could also do after that, and I wouldn't recommend it before that. that. You can use a prayer book and you say a few prayers from the prayer book, as many as you like or as little as you like. It doesn't matter. In my world, it's much more flexible, and I think it, it just helps us to pray better and more actually like in. Because the point is to go in. The point is not just to get it done and just read prayers and go... Okay, done. Like, check that box. Not the point. Not the point. The point is to go in, find yourself, and through that to find God. And through that to find deep meaning for your life. Because it's inside you. The kingdom of heaven is actually inside you. The gospel is not kidding. So, after you say Jesus' prayer, 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, Maybe a couple of prayers from the prayer book. Maybe you already memorized some. Use those ones that are very heartfelt. Read the gospel every day, rest of your life. Make a pledge now. I'm sending out cards. Try it. Interacting with that word of the scripture. Christ says, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. He's not kidding. He says, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. St. Siloan says, behind every word there's a power, but behind the scriptures there's an uncreated power. Just interacting with them changes us. Just reading them touches our heart and kind of rubs it a little bit and takes away a little bit of the rust and gives a little bit of light. The scriptures are like, there's three things that are the key. The Jesus prayer, the liturgy, and the scriptures. These are the tripod of the soul that enables us to stand up and be spiritual and to keep moving with some small shred of stability. The Jesus prayer, the liturgy, which is body and blood of Christ, and the scriptures. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Over and 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 over again. And over and over and over again. Keep going. I'm always finding new things. I've been doing this for 25 years. Every time I'm like, wow, I never saw that before. And then there's also sometimes where it's like the scripture that I like or that I know about or that I don't really like, <laughs> something that bugs me. I get it just right on the day when I need it. And I call, they, they call that a God wink. You know? that God is like working through it to speak to us specifically in our day to give us a word. This sacramental word is exceptionally important. God is always speaking to us. Always. So often, either we don't want to hear or we're not listening. Prayer is more or less a time to listen. It's a time to just be still and listen. That's how we know other people, right? If, if, if if you're talking to me, how am I going to know you if I don't listen? It's the same thing with God. God is speaking to us in the circumstances of our lives. Oftentimes in a concert of many, many ways about what we should be doing or not doing. And yet it is precisely, it's, it's like, an, you know, our society, it's like it's almost hard to listen sometimes, isn't it? We're so busy or difficulties or troubles or whatever that we actually have to pay somebody to do it sometimes. Like a therapist or something, right? You got to pay them to listen because it is such an art. And it's so nuanced and so um, subtle of a matter. And so to learn how to listen to also kind of a subtle matter. It's not just a given where it's just like, okay. I'm, it's like sensitizing our heart to be able to hear God is a very important task. Because again, God is always speaking. It's just that we, we have to know that. And oftentimes it will be through the other. It will be in the scriptures, but a lot of times, like, you know, at, at seminary, they say, Father, I don't know what to do. I'm wondering about this question. Da, 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 da. I say, what does your wife say? He says, well, this, that, and the other. I said, that's what I say too. <laughs> There's a, a saying from Father Zacharias. He says, make everyone a prophet. 
And it's not about just listening to everybody and taking every single thing that everybody says. It's about having a prophetic attitude towards life that life oftentimes is, you know, sacramental in its very core. And a sacrament is really something, you know, it's kind of a highfalutin word on some level, a little sterile as well. It's very Western because we, we have mysteries in the Orthodox Church. We don't have sacraments, but it's an easy word to talk about, so I use that word. Sacrament is a way that through this world, God conveys his life and his energy to us. So, the Eucharist, right? Through the bread and the wine, which are this world, God conveys to us his life and his energy, his love. That water of baptism, through the waters of the baptism, grace and life are conveyed to the person who is being baptized through the world, through the matter of the world. And that's why when we talk about icons in the Orthodox Church, Iconography is not just like a secondary phenomenon as if it was like, oh yeah, we like pretty paintings and they're a little weird. No. It's precisely through the matter of this world that God comes to us. This is what the incarnation is. This is what nativity is about. God is with us. How? Through the matter of this world in the incarnation. God takes this world to himself. And through this world, he speaks to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the very God, very man and very God, perfect God, perfect man. He speaks to us through the matter of this world. That's the incarnation. And precisely what the church says is the, the entire mm, vision of orthodoxy is incarnational. That because of the incarnation, now the bread, the wine, the water, all of these things convey to us the life of God because of that incarnational vision of the church of like what matter is what its capacity is in the sense of it's always secretly sacramental because God made it and that ultimately still in our life today God is trying to convey to us his life his love his energy so prayer is the thing that sensitizes us to that fact the more I pray, the more I see that. The more I pray, the more I'm open to that. The more I pray, the more I can actually listen to you and therefore be able to ultimately hear God as well. If I can't hear you, there's no hope of me ever ho hearing God. You know, there's a, there's a textbook definition of humility that says always being able to hear a word when spoken to. That's Abba Dorotheus' textbook definition of what humility is. Somebody says, stop it, you're being a jerk. You say, I'm sorry, forgive me. That's humility. You know, the opposite is obvious. Hey, why are you talking to me? I'm not doing anything. I'm a good guy. Don't you know who I am? Right? That's not humility. Spiritual life always starts with my neighbor, really, when it gets down to it. If I can't hear you, I won't hear God. Sorry. If I can't love you, I can't love God. Sorry. If I can't be merciful to you, God can't be merciful to me. Sorry. If I can't forgive you, God can't forgive me, sorry. It always starts with the other. And in an ultimate sense in the, the church, in that you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me, the other is Christ. So, I'll take some questions, but I wanna review. Prayer first, prayer is the answer. You need to be consistent. You need to try to do this. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I do this all day. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Prove me wrong. Start with the Jesus prayer. Five minutes. Read the scriptures every day. Save you prayers from the prayer book. And even if possible, just something like a book like this, which is called the Art of Prayer, shows how, how uh, advanced prayer can be. There's even an art for it. Art form, prayer. Um, you just take a book like this and just read one of these, you know, just a little paragraph about prayer. Just read one every day. Or maybe something else. A uh, book uh, from the fathers or something. Just do it. And when you do it with prayer, it opens. And those words, you actually begin to see what's behind those words, which is the very spirit and life of God. And through them, we are changed. We don't change ourselves. We just become available to the God who's able to change us. We don't fix ourselves. This is not self-help. This is just opening up to God's energy and his life, which is the thing that grants us repentance life, hope, peace, everything that we want, it's in that. God gives it, we just have to be available and open. 
questions about any of this stuff? Because I can talk forever, you know? <laughs> I'm a seminary teacher, so I know how to talk. Now, you, you, you only have one opportunity to do this, so, you know, um, I know that there's always somebody that has a question and say, Father, I didn't want to ask you this during the time when you actually asked me to, to, you know, to bring these questions out. So, now's the time to uh, ask. Yes? How do you apply this wisdom with a loved one in your family who is um, resistant to faith and God, who was so damaged as a mm. child. Mm -hmm. I believe this person is seeking, but very resistant. Mm. And yeah, my heart breaks because I want to, I mean, I obviously pray for this person. Right. Um, how can I do Prayer first. Yeah. All you gotta do is say that Jesus prayed for them. We don't have to fix people, we just have to love them and pray for them. It's the easiest answer, that's all the gospel says, you know? There's three things that we have to do that the gospel gives us for our neighbor. We bless them, we do good for them, and we pray for them. Enemies and friends. So even when people are kind of upset with us and kind of fighting us maybe in these kinds of situations, it's, it's still, that still applies. Bless, do good, and pray. And the more that you just realize you don't have to fix it, but if you, you know, I'm here today as a, as a result of the fact that like 15, 10 or 15 people in a Bible study when I was in high school got together and decided that they would put they would pray for me like on a consistent basis, you know? And it opened my heart. It, the thing, it's, it was the thing that kind of opened me enough to be able to move me in a different direction. So prayer really does work. And ask other people to pray or send his name to the, or her to, name to the monastery or to, to other monasteries because that really helps. It's like when there's a problem, prayer first, you know? The easiest way is just to say to Jesus prayer and then slowly, you know, in God's time. You know, the more we fight and push, the worse it, worse it gets. We kind of, it's like the finger trap. You kind of pull, it just gets tighter. Yeah. So, other questions? Thoughts, comments, problems? Yes. Um, so, can you talk about the incorporation of, so we're, we haven't even started our catechumen classes. Mm -hmm. um, and the incorporation of um, icon and candle, like the prayer book out there was very overwhelming. So when mm -hmm. I started reading your Acquiring the Mind of Christ, that was helpful for just that very small, like start small. And then your 10 minutes, like, oh, that's even smaller. <laughs> That'll be encouraging too. So um, can you just talk and speak to that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's so necessary for us to have a, a, a concentrated time of prayer where we actually close the door Nobody can come in, or we get up early enough so we know we're not going to be bothered. We do light the candle. We do have an icon corner. Um, we don't necessarily kind of stare at it all the time, but it's like, it's just this, this area that I go to that kind of helps me to find, if I have a place for that, that I can find a place for myself through that kind of, it, it helps me to find myself, you know? So having a prayer corner is essential. Having a, a lampada burning in front of it, it's like kind of turning an icon on, you know? It kind of gives that sense of, not only devotion, but also just, there is uh, something in the Old Testament where, uh, especially before an icon of Christ or even on the altar of the church, you know, in the Old Testament in Exodus, it says, you know, place a vigil lamp with olive oil in front of my presence to burn all day, you know, because this will be, you know, this is something that's pleasing to me, you know, thus says the Lord. Um, so that's, it's just kind of, it's, it's Old Testament based I um, mean, it comes from the icon of Christ and the, and the all, actual altar of Christ and God. Um, but just being, you know, consistent in doing what we can. You know, the gospel is epitomized by, by a very simple um, maxim. And it says, you know, do what you can and leave the rest to God. A lot of times what we can do is not something that we want to do. But it's essential that we do it because then God can kind of take us to a, a higher place or a better place or like to do more. You know, so we don't want to get overwhelmed by like all the rules and all the things we should do. And, you know, we can shoot ourselves to death, as it were, because we're constantly shooting. You know, I should do this. I should. I should be better. I should do, do what you can do and leave the rest to God. And I just hope in God. And that hope is never, ever lost or put to shame. You know, whoever hoped in the Lord and was put to shame, it says in the Old Testament. Um, so just start small and be consistent and have a separated, you know, like people say, you know, 
well, Father, I do my prayers in my car, so how can I do prostrations when I'm driving? It's like, don't do prostrations while you're driving, please. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not, that's not having an actual time of prayer. You know, so it has to be dedicated and just, you know, Father Zachariah says, where is the desert if not when you close the door of your room and you start to pray, you know, by yourself? And it's also not a family prayer time either. This is just like me and, me and Jesus, you know? Very, very important. Okay. And that's just one word about the icon. You know, this is an icon of St. Anna, as I mentioned, but this icon went myrrh for five years. And it's the very nature of the church to be miraculous. You know, the church itself is a miracle. It's the miracle of God's presence in our midst, of Christ in our midst, and of God who is with us. All of these things are just reminders that it's God working through the matter of this world to save us. And icons are not just a, an artwork, but it is rather an entire worldview that embraces the sacramentality of the entire creation as a means by which we can come to know God. There's no way around this world. You know, we want to spiritualize things and be very spiritual and just kind of be philosophical. It's not true. It doesn't work. St. Maximus says, on, this, on the road to God stands this world. He says, it is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of testing, he says. We cannot circumvent this tree. We cannot get around the world, the matter of the world, the physicality of this world. We have to realize that the world is good and that the spiritual and the material co-inhere in one, in one another. And it's through the church that that spiritual mm, presence, that spiritual existence is manifest most clearly. And St. Simeon, the new theologian, says that it's, it's through the Holy Spirit that we can understand the alphabet of the creation and learn to discern its letters and speak its language. That's why I said that God's always speaking to us. It's just it's through the Holy Spirit that that becomes a, pal a manifested reality in our lives. So that everything declares the glory of God in our life. We can see God in the smallest glass of water, in the smallest child's face, even in the, in the greatest tragedy of our life, we see God. Why? Because it's through that Holy Spirit that is working within us that helps us to understand, to know. So icons are not just some kind of small thing, by the way. It's an entire worldview about how this world is used by God to speak to us and to convey his life and salvation to us. Um, the Holy Spirit resides in the church, the matter of the church, in this building. It's different than, you know, a Starbucks. The altar is literally the celestial throne of heaven. It's one in the same place. It's a non-local reality that's everywhere present, but most dense in this place, right in there. It's the same prayers that were used at the consecration of Solomon's temple in, in the Second Chronicles chapter 6, 7, and 8. It's the same reality. It's the same God, and His glory fills this place in a very special way, the matter of this place, just like He feel, fills the matter of your own heart and wants to dwell there more so. And that's something that we have to try to have a dynamic increase and try to increase our, our attention to that so that it can really truly grow and not just be kind of a static Sunday-only Christian, but really a dynamic reality which actually lives inside of us. It's a great challenge. But it's possible, and we need to do it. It's not like it's not like I'm a monk, and like I have the op, you know, I, I don't have the option. It's like no, none of us have the option to do that. I'm here to say, like, we all have to do that. We all have to pray. We all have to have an inner life. It is precisely the way that we affect our union with God, which is our salvation. There is no other way. There's no other way. And we do what we can. Huh. See, it's simple. It's not tough. Nobody has to be scared. Oh, so scary. It's like, no, do something. What is that? I mean, like the, one of the sayings, like, don't just do something, stand there. That's the orthodoxy, you know? It's like there has to be a way forward, and we just have to kind of keep working on it, you know? And a little bit here, a little bit there, it goes so far. Do what you can and leave the rest to God. Other questions? Yes, Father. Father, as we eventually approach to venerate the icon. Is there an attitude that uh, how, uh, uh, for many people, venerating the uh, air working icon or the relics is kind of a foreign experience? Hmm. And uh, how would you prayerfully approach such a thing? Hmm. Just be open. You know, I mean, it's not of this world. Like, we're encountering 
the grace of God through the matter of this world. It, we do it in the Eucharist, you know, and icons are based in the Eucharist. It's that the matter of this world can convey God's life to us. So in the same way that we approach the Eucharist, it's a different phenomenon, different, different thing, but the same phenomenon as it were. We're dealing with God's life, God's grace, which, God, which is God himself. Um, it's another kind of extension of the phenomenon of the Eucharist into the material world. And really, you know, icons are the four, uh, forerunners of the world to come, which will somehow persist in this world. We will be raised in our bodies. I, believe, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come in my body. St. Paul says, in a, tw in a twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed in our body. And we tend to forget that. We tend to think like, you know, in kind of Aristotelian terms that I'm going to blast off from this world. We don't have to worry about recycling anymore because it's all, you know, destroyed anyways. And we just blast off and we go to heaven. It's like, no. If the kingdom of God is within and the kingdom of God is actually here and that the light of God dwells in this place, how will that temple be destroyed? It will be renewed. It will be changed but it's not necessarily going to be, we're not going to relocate, you know. Um, the matter of this world will persist somehow, and that's the mystery of the world to come. However, the icon, especially miracle working icons, foreshadow this in a very <coughs> profound and real way. Let me tell you about one miracle working icon. There was an icon on the iconostas of uh, the church in Cicero, Chicago. And in the mid-90s, this icon of the Mother of God started to weep. Quite a phenomenon. Everybody got really excited. Even the news, the news truck was there, and people were lined up and caused quite a stir. The icon was weeping, and about maybe, I don't know, it didn't do it for very long, maybe like four or five months or something like that. It wasn't long. And icon stopped. Kind of the, everything died down. And then a couple years later, the church burned to the ground, completely razed. Absolute tragedy, complete loss. Fire, like four alarm fire, very big Antiochian church. And um, in the morning when the pastor came to, to the parish uh, to kind of survey the damage, everything was gone. And it's all this smoke and kind of like soot and He's, he's walking through the, the rubble and he comes up to where the iconostas was and there is the icon of the Mother of God completely intact. Everything else is gone and all it has is just a little bit of minor smoke damage. And that icon is still in the church to this day that they rebuilt. Same thing with the Tikvin icon. The Tikvin icon, like Archbishop John of Chicago, they were coming out in World War II, they were leaving Latvia, and literally like the bombs were falling on the, on the town, on the city, and on the port where they were at, and the boat starts motoring her way at its five, five mile an hour pace out of the port, and bombs are falling, and, and Archbishop John said they would go like this, they'd come right to the boat and they'd be like, meow, meow, and like the Mother of God's like on, you know, this icon that's like 1500 year old, old icon of the Mother of God, it's like, it's so powerful, it's like they even think that it could be like one of the original ones that St. Luke wrote, it's like, it's that old, it's like pre-iconoclastic. Um, literally the bombs are falling, meow, like the boat just goes away, just motors away. Our Lady of Guadalupe, they've tried to blow it up like 20 times with dynamite and stuff. They put dynamite, you know, communist kind of crazy people go in there, like, uh, put in the dynamite, explodes this way, explodes that way. It won't ever... Somehow there's an incorruptibility in these things, which is a preamble to the incorruptibility of the world to come. St. John Maximovich is incorrupt. He's in Saint San Francisco. He's under glass. He's got fingernails. He's got his beard. He's got his hair. I'm sure, you know, it's, it's probably, you know... They don't comb it that often, except maybe when they change his vestments. Um, but he is incorrupt. And this is a foreshadowing of the world to come. This is a, it's kind of like a preamble, a precursor to the incorruption of the kingdom of heaven, where everything will be incorruptible. We will be raised incorruptible, St. Paul says. 
even like the miracle working relics of the saints, it's like sometimes like the, you know, um, Saint Spiridon, like he's in corrupt, he's in Corfu. They have to change his shoes every month or two because they get worn out. Where's he going? Like the, the, the coffin is like locked. I don't know. I mean, they literally like, you know, the power of a saint, like they say that the martyrs, they can appear anywhere they want at any time. I don't know. It's like in World War II, there was the news, in the news articles, uh, St. Uh, Minas, all these Greek, uh, the Greek soldiers were all kind of cornered and the, the battle was hopeless and they had a prayer service, a, a, a prayer supplication service, a practices to St. Minas. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this is in the newspaper. All this light, people riding horses, out of nowhere, come, kill the Nazis, and all of a sudden disappear. This is a newspaper. This is like historical news of like actual happenings in the past, une unexplainable. You know, this stuff happens. There is another world. And somehow it's in the church and it's an incorruptible world. It's a world that doesn't decay. It's a world that doesn't die. It's a world that lives forever. It's a life in God. And all this stuff is a foreshadowing of it. All the things that are in the church, there's so many like incorruptible saints, incorruptible icons, things that you can't even explain. It's that grace and that life of the world to come present among us today. So all you have to do is be open. Available. Who knows, you know? Approach it as a dialogue rather than uh, a monologue with yourself. You know, just be open to God in the liturgy. Be open to God in your prayers. Be open to God in the, the icons, in the relics. They work. I mean, it works. It's, it's a phenomenon, but it's not on the level of this world. You know, the cross kind of gives us also a sign of like how we live and how God lives. We live on this horizontal level like this. You know, we just kind of go along, we're driving our car, we get to our spot. The cross is this thing that kind of interrupts all of that and it goes up. Everything in the church is actually an upward movement. It's a vertical place. It's a place of intersection where heaven and earth meet. And it's all up. <coughs> you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. All of this stuff is this way. And for us, it's a cross. We're like, how does that work? I don't understand. It's like, it just is what it is. There's no like how. There's no why. It just is. God was and he is. Christ just is God. I don't know how he's God. St. Maximus says it will remain a mystery in eternity. It's really that big of a mystery. The church just is what it is. There's no like kind of uh, computation that needs to, to happen in order for us to encounter it. That's why they say, unless you become like children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Because it's that simple. Even St. Paul says, I, 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 I wish that you weren't uh, so easily deceived by the simplicity that is in Christ. It's so simple. You just have to approach it with that simplicity and kind of let go and let God. And then ultimately, you know, that miracle happens.